I grew up in a family where church was not very important, and I never had the opportunity to understand that there was a God. Since I was a child, I grew up in a Christian home where my mom taught me the value of seeking Christ. God had a plan and purpose for my life that I could not see. Terms such as surrender, obedience, and submission were always a real problem for me. I secretly believed I wasn't good enough for God. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and everything began to change. God has my whole heart, and Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. I am here today to say that Jesus is who He says He is, and He is my Lord and Savior. That Jesus Christ truly is my Lord and my Savior. Well, good morning. Good to see everyone. Um, we got a standalone message today. Uh, it's called Going Public. Uh, I had some people ask me about baptism, and I realized it's a confusing topic. There's a lot of different ideas and opinions and so forth. In fact, I started off your outline with that. You have an opinion about baptism. You know when it should be done, how it should be done, if it should be done, maybe it shouldn't be done, um, not important, or it's some people be believe you can't get into heaven without it. So there's lots of opinions, and it's emotional to people. And most of our opinions come from where we were brought up. All right. So as a teenager, I started attending a Baptist church, and since we've got Baptist in our name, we must do it right, right? Baptists have to do it right. I don't know what a Methodist is. What's a Methodist? I don't know. But Baptists baptize a certain way. It's got to be right. That's, that's my experience. You grew up in a different church, different type, different, different way of doing it, different time in your life to doing it, and so forth. So I'm going to tell you out front, my agenda today is to get you to understand what I believe is correct according to Scripture about baptism, about when it should be done and how it should be done. And if you're a Jesus follower and you haven't been baptized since you became a Jesus follower, that you will commit yourself to being baptized now. Not right now, but <laughs> soon. We had one person from the first service. And so we'll see. And this came as a result of some questions I got, actually from some people that are here this morning. So, why is Baptism even in the Bible. Why is it even discussed? Why is it important? It goes back to one place. One of the last things Jesus said is kind of like marching orders to his followers, to the church. This is some stuff you need to do. He was leaving to go back to heaven, right? This was after the resurrection. Matthew records it in Matthew 28. Luke records it in Luke chapter 1. He said, okay, so therefore, here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. Go and make Jesus followers. Go and make Christians everywhere, all over the world, all the nations. All right? uh, his audience was mostly Jewish, and it was important to for the Jewish people to understand this is not just for Jews, this is for everybody. Okay, so you've made this disciple. You've shared the gospel. You've told people that you're separated from God by your, by your sins. You need to accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He rose from the, he paid for your sin by dying on the cross. He rose from the dead to conquer sin and death. If you believe that, you can be a disciple, a follower, all right? Once you do that, what's the next thing Jesus says? Be baptized. Why? Well, we'll talk about that. And he said, in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And when I baptize people, I do that. And maybe you've seen that. Uh, maybe when you were baptized, it's interesting because in the name of the Father, Yahweh, but then he says, in my name, right? This is Jesus talking, which is kind of odd, right? You need to baptize in my name, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit. So, here's the question. If Jesus said to do this, should it even be a question, right? As a follower, you follow the instructions of the person you're following. This is Jesus' instruction. In fact, the next verse says, obeying. All right? How many parents we got out here? I don't know if there are parents, right? 
So what is the, one of the big things as a parent you try and teach your kids? To obey either your rules or the laws of the land or God's laws or whatever. We used to have a saying in our house, delayed obedience is what, guys? The disobedience, right. Okay, so, shouldn't even be a question about it, but we'll talk about it, all right? Now, we need to do a little Greek study. I'm not going to throw a lot of Greek at you this morning, but to, you need to understand this, how this all came about. So, New Testament was written in Greek, and so, um, we're not going to read it in Greek, but the, there's a word in Greek called baptizo. Baptizo, accent's right, all right? That word in Greek meant to the Greeks, all right, to wash, to plunge, to soak, to dip. It was a word they used if a ship sunk. It was baptizdoed, all right, in the ocean, whatever. So when the translators going through the New Testament, written in Greek, most of the time they translated it. Like God is theos. So you put uh, God in place, theos. They got to this word, and they decided to uh, transliterate it instead of translate it. Well, what does that mean? Basically, you create a word, all right? So, in place of the Greek B, we put in English B, beta in Greek, English B. Alpha A in Greek, A in English. So, you take that sidzo, and you make baptize, all right? So... But the word in the Greek means what? To wash, to plunge, to soak, or to dip. But then it became a religious word. Well, let's back up, understand about this word. We have, or experts have, discovered a pickle recipe. How many people make pickles? Anybody? They have a 2,200-year-old pickle recipe. I forget the guy's name. But here's what he said to do. He said, take cucumbers and baptizo them in boiling water and then baptizo them in vinegar. All right? Well, he didn't, then, then they die and go to heaven, right, the cucumbers? Because they've been baptized. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's a simple word, common word that meant to, to dip or to plunge or to soak, right? So, Another confusing thing is when we get to the New Testament, sometimes the translators translated this word to wash, for example, and other times they didn't. So let me give you an example where, actually two examples, I think, where they translated baptizo, all right? So this is Jesus speaking about the religious leaders. He said, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. All right, so they go buy food, they come home, they baptizo, <laughs> And they observed many other traditions, such as washing or baptizoing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. All right. So after lunch today, when you folks go home and eat, you can baptizo your dishes afterwards. All right. Because it means simply to wash them. All right. So it really gets confusing, doesn't it? Um, they didn't wash their hands just because they were dirty. They washed their hands because that was the law. You got to wash your hands before you eat. <clears throat> Excuse me, the text goes on. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law ask him, Jesus, why don't your disciples do this? Following this old age tradition of washing your hands before you eat. They eat without performing the hand washing ceremony. So again, it's not to become clean, it's because there was a rule or law, gotta wash your hands before you eat. And they didn't do it. And then we get another incident where Jesus didn't do it, all right? This is in Luke chapter 11. Jesus sat down with his host, and the host was amazed to see that he sat down and ate without first performing the baptizo, the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. So, in Matthew 28, we could say, go on to all the world and wash <laughs> the disciples. Make disciples and wash them. But no, they didn't translate that word. They transliterated. They made that word. Now it has religious connotation. The problem is, what is the religious connotation? Sometimes people sprinkle babies. Other people are baptized other ways. 
So we're going to try and, best I can understand it, what exactly means and how it should be done and when it should be done. So I put on your outline, how did this common practice, a word that's commonly used in language, take on religious meaning? So we'll go back about 400 years before Jesus. So people would discover Judaism, you know, and they would embrace it. They would think, this is a cool religion. Uh, they only have one God. Everybody else has lots of gods, and, and they got a lot of other neat stuff. So I'm not a Jew by birth, but I want to practice Judaism as my religion. So they would come and ask, is there some way we can do that? And so the Jewish uh, leaders came up with things you can do to become Jewish without being Jewish. So if you're a man, the first thing was circumcision, surgery, all right? So you had to be pretty serious to take that step, right? Uh, there was other things. You'd have to learn the Old Testament, memorize portions of the Old Testament. You'd have to actually do what the Old Testament said, all right? And then eventually they came up with this other thing, this personal ceremonial washing. And this meant you in your privacy of your home, or in privacy somewhere, you would literally wash yourself ceremonially, ceremonially to represent being cleansed of non-Jewishism, and now I'm becoming Jewish. All right? So now we'll fast forward to Jesus' day. And this guy shows up by the name of John. He was kind of an unusual character. He dressed differently, he ate differently, and he's out preaching in the wilderness, all right? Now, we call him, New Testament calls him John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He was in the wilderness preaching that people should be baptized, there is our word, baptizo, to show. All right, it's a reason we're going to do this to show something that they had repented of their sins and turned to God's forgiveness. So John's preaching was pretty simple. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. You're Jewish. You think you're fine because you follow the laws and all the rules. But no, inside, in your heart, you need to repent. And so people, some people heard this message and said, yeah, you're right. I need to do that. And so then he began to, in the Jordan River, baptize people. Before it was done privately, this is the first time we know of, it was done publicly. Of course, he got the nickname John the, the Baptizer. He could be John the Scrubber, John the Washer, John the Dipper, <laughs> whatever. But we call him John the Baptist, not because he was in a Baptist church. All right? <clears throat> now, so he's there out in the wilderness. Uh, somebody asked me how far it is from Jerusalem to the Jordan River. I can't remember. It seemed like it was an hour bus drive, so it's got to be like 50 miles. So it's not nearby. So if you're leaving Jerusalem to go see this guy, John, that everybody's talking about, it was a trip, all right? No, no buses back then. It's downhill to get there, but you've got to go uphill to get back, all right? So the text says this. All of Judea, mostly the people who have been in Jerusalem, including the people in Jerusalem, though, went out to see and hear John. Didn't have the internet and TV and all that stuff. You had to actually go, right? So people made this trip. It'd be more than a day trip just to hear this guy that everybody was talking about by the name of John. And when they confessed their sins, the ones that did, again, what did he do? Yes, I repent of my sin. I confess my sin. I need God's forgiveness. He would dip them in baptize them in the Jordan River. So, next question. Why did John insist that people be baptized? And the simple answer is this. To make their commitment, their decision to repent, to God, of course, public. That ceremony was done private before. Now John is saying, you need to let people know. And this was done in public. This, there, there was a crowd around. And so you had to be sure what you're doing because it's kind of weird, right? Okay, John, I believe this. There are all these people looking at me, but I want you to baptize me. 
But John had a, another purpose. He was to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Now the Messiah, they've been waiting for the Messiah for a thousand years. Can you imagine? He's coming. We know one of these days the Messiah of God's coming. He was to be the forerunner. Meaning, right after him, this guy, Messiah, was going to come. So John's doing his thing down there at the Jordan River. And one day, guess who shows up? Reading the text from John chapter 1. John saw Jesus coming to him. And of course, he realized who it was. We would say the Messiah. Here he described, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the real purpose of the Messiah, not what they thought was going to set up an earthly kingdom. Right? So it gets a little confusing because as we read the text in Matthew, what is, what is uh, John's response? I understand you're the Messiah. Since you're the Messiah, the Lamb of God, Matthew records it this way. He went to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. Why? You're the Holy One of God. I'm just poor little John. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. If anybody's doing baptizing, you should be baptizing me. So why are you coming to me? And Jesus' response was, needs to be done. Should be done. Must carry out what God requires. And so John agreed and baptizes Jesus. Now, why did Jesus insist on being baptized? Evidently, he was in obedience to his father. Uh, it began his ministry. It set him aside publicly, announcing who he was, uh, confirming that he was the Lamb of God, as John said. But I also believe it is an example. If I'm a Jesus follower, I do the things Jesus did, right? And one of those was being baptized, even when, according to the definition of repentance, he didn't need to do, right? Now, Another fascinating thing. <clears throat> we talked about Paul a lot lately. He went about starting churches after Jesus' time, starting churches in Turkey and Greece and those areas. So he comes across a bunch of people that had learned about John's baptism and been baptized that way. So when they baptized, he says, what baptism did you experience? They'd already been baptized. He said, you've been baptized? Yeah, I've been baptized. What baptism? I'm just telling you about Jesus now said, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance of sin. But John himself did what? He told people to believe in the one who came after, came later, meaning who? Jesus. Now, here's the fascinating thing. As soon as they heard this, so we were baptized by John's baptism, but not Jesus' baptism. So what did they do? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Tell you my history. My mom, mother had me sprinkled as a Methodist when I was a baby. Didn't know, I didn't wear it, wasn't aware of it, of course. As a teenager in a Baptist church, I walked down the aisle and they baptized me. And then as under the water, and then as an adult, I didn't feel like I, when I walked down the aisle <laughs> that I really was a Jesus follower when I was a teenager. So as an adult, I was baptized again. So you could say I've been, been baptized three times. Why? Well, it's the order and the method that matters. On your outline. Jesus wants to see the results of the decision on the inside. That's got to be first, so that then it could be displayed on the outside. As a baby, was, did I have make a decision on the inside? Of course not. So, kind of, somebody asked me if it, does, if it doesn't, if it doesn't count. In some ways, it doesn't count, right? Because it's not in the right order. So why do we think it's important to be baptized by immersion? All right. Biggest reason, other than the fact that that seems to be the way the Bible instructs us to do it, is because of the symbolism. All right. So how do we bury people? We bury them on the side. Do we bury them on their stomach? How do we bury people? On their back, right? Face up. Right? 
So, look at the symbolism that Paul gives us. It's actually in Romans and Colossians. We're going to read it in Colossians. When you become a Jesus follower, you are buried with Christ when you were baptized. So it symbolizes that, right? And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So sometimes when we baptize, we say it. Buried to the old life, risen to new life. Perfect symbolism of being buried with Christ and risen. Sprinkling water on your head does not have that symbolism, does it? All right, so summarizing. Baptism is a, I'm going to read number two first. I think it's a better order. A personal declaration of a new association. I wasn't a Jesus follower. I was doing my own thing. Now I'm going to be a Jesus follower. All right? So I've got a new association, personally. But it's also what? A public declaration of a new association. So uh, there's no secret agent Christians, we're basically saying. All right? Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, you, let, you need to let people know. So this is a public declar declaration. But most importantly, depending on your church background, it's not a condition of salvation. All the people in heaven that in the Old Testament or in Jesus' day, they, none of them were baptized. They're going to be in heaven, right? <clears throat> Thief on the cross, he was never baptized. Um, but, big but, it is a point of obedience. Are you going to be obedient? If you're a Jesus follower, if he's the Lord, the boss, Jesus Christ, are you going to let him Lead. Be the boss. Now, push back. Well, I can go to heaven without being baptized. Yeah, absolutely can. But are you going to be obedient? People, a lot of people don't go to church anymore. I can go to heaven. I can be a Christian without going to church. Yeah. <laughs> but are you being obedient? Scripture says Jesus Christ died for the church. He calls the church the bride of Christ. You don't want to be part of the bride? <laughs> so it's obedience. Now, we make it even a little more difficult for you around here to get baptized. If dunking you under water isn't a discouraging enough, especially for ladies, their hair gets all wet and, and they're concerned about their looks. But anyway, we make it even more, more uh, challenging. Maybe challenging is a better word. We require you or strongly encourage you to do a video testimony. So what am I talking about? All right, so we usually do a baptism right here. <clears throat> now, when I get people down in there and get ready to baptize them, I ask them if they want to say anything. 99% of the time, nobody wants to talk. They're nervous. So here's what we do. We think it's important that you make a public profession of faith. So we make it actually easier for you. So we'll get you alone in a room. We usually do it right here. And a video person, usually Josh, and myself, I ask you questions like, why do you want to be baptized? A uh, little bit of your background. Um, who was influential in this? So it's, you know, it's 15 minutes or so. We ask you questions, you answer them. And then we, they, not me, somebody edits that down to like a three-minute testimony. So when it comes baptism time, and most of you have seen this, we play the video and then we baptize you. And then you ultimately have a baptismal video with the actual baptism as part of it. Okay, so it seems that everybody's, I think everybody, almost everybody, nobody wants to do the video. <laughs> okay, so it's an act of uh, courage, if you will. <clears throat> so, to summarize, it's to encourage people to go public with their commitment to follow Jesus. All right? A vocal commitment. Now, a couple of pluses. Every time I experience this, my faith grows. I am encouraged to see the transformation Jesus makes in a person's life. One of the pushbacks I have is this. If you're, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, Jesus died for you. You can't get your hair wet for Jesus. Kind of a silly excuse, right? Another thing I think is really important I believe whatever you have to say on that testimony, somebody needs to hear. Somebody else is 
has something in common with you. And Jesus has gotten you through that, transformed you through that, and you've been obedient. So we're going to show you one from last year. Some of you have never seen one of these. Actually, this is Cassidy. Cassidy has COVID right now. <laughs> we need to be praying for her, okay? Hi, my name is Cassidy Wilhelm. I grew up in Frederick County. I recently, one year ago, moved to Smithsburg. I work in Frederick County Public Schools. Uh, I work with kids that need that extra support in the classroom setting. Um, for something fun that I like to do outside of school is cookie decorating. I have a daughter named Belle and uh, two stepdaughters named Ashley and Taylor, and my husband's name's Walt. I've been married seven years. If somebody were to ask me uh, what my life was like before Christ, I would say that I lived my life through other people's approval. In my childhood, I went in and out of churches. It was never really consistent. It was not, not something that was super important to me. And then after the passing of my mom, um, is when it became clear to me that this is where I need to be and this is where I want to be. Earlier in my life, I was involved in domestic violence. And every time that I was in a situation where there was violence involved or there was um, police officers that came to my house, I always was reminded that um, God is there. And I always had that feeling that he was watching me, he was there, he was protecting me. And just coming into church, there's just no better place I'd rather be. This is, this is what brings me joy in my life. So the reason I want to be baptized is because I've realized that I can't do this life without him. Um, it gives me a sense of joy and purpose and comfort knowing that I'm closer to God. My name is Cassidy Wilhelm. Um, I am here today to publicly announce that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Cassidy, thank you for your testimony. So upon your public profession of faith, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we get to cheer for you too that's another big plus it's a celebration all right next step simple baptism isn't a condition of salvation you're going to get to heaven one way or the other all right if you're jesus follower it's evidence proof of salvation proof to other people if you're a christian and you've never been baptized since you became a Christian, and particularly under the water, we believe you need to be baptized. It's a point of obedience. You as a parent expected your kids to obey. Your Heavenly Father would like us to obey. So here's the question then. What is stopping you? Let me pray. Father God, thank you. I thank you for Cassidy and her testimony and all those that went before her. And we thank you that this Christianity thing is not to be kept inside. It's to let other people know. Um, so I pray for anybody watching, listening, uh, it's not a Jesus follower. Today would be the day that they would become a Jesus follower. And consequently then, ob obeying and becoming a, uh, being baptized. Um, other people have Jesus, been Jesus followers. Maybe they were baptized as a baby and and sprinkle some other time in their life. We just pray, God, that they, hey, I want to be obedient. I want to do it the right way at the right time. And so I pray that you would speak to those hearts. I, my privilege to give this invitation on your behalf, Jesus. And we thank you, and in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>